So, uh, everyone, uh, I'm Keith from MITRE. Uh, I'm one of the organizers from MLMAC, uh, the Machine Learning Model Attribution Challenge. Um, and I'll help facilitate this session today. Uh, if you're just here for the, the uh, last tutorial, uh, learning about large language models and maybe some of the problems uh, they could have. Um, we're also concerned with them, but here we're worried about an adversary uh, purposefully misusing them as opposed to maybe problems that might arise from their, their training process. Um, so we've got here for the next hour and a half or so. Um, uh, here's the kind of planned agenda. Uh, first, uh, one of my co-organizers, Deepesh, is going to give a bit of an overview of the competition, talk about our motivation, uh, what we're hoping to learn, and the structure of the challenge. Um, then I will uh, talk a bit about the uh, uh, the submissions we received, um, give kind of a taxonomy of the solutions. Um, then we'll have uh, four talks from the uh, top four uh, participants. Uh, the first two will be pre-recorded videos, and then we have the runner-up and winner uh, here uh, presenting their solutions live. Um, then uh, give a very quick uh, kind of what we're doing next with this challenge uh, and open it up to kind of group discussion. Uh, so there'll be some time for questions for um, the solution presentations uh, right after those, but then more time to, to discuss the competition. And if you don't think of questions, we have questions for you. So uh, come up with some good questions. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'll hand it over uh, to Deepesh. Uh, or sorry, real quick, thank you to all of our supporters, co-organizers, uh, the organizations that helped fund the prizes, uh, compute credits, all of that. And yeah, Deepesh. Yeah, so I do want to acknowledge uh, Hugging Face for giving us the credits, uh, Microsoft for coming up with the threat model, and Keith uh, and the team to come up with amazing logistics and technical support. And Hiram, who couldn't be here, uh, also helped us with model proxy. And uh, thanks to Schmidt Futures and Mercator Center for the grant they gave us for the prize money. So I'll dive deep into, first of all, this problem uh, we have around uh, machine learning model attribution. So think of this like, uh, game of kindergarten where you're trying to connect the base model with the fine-tuned model and I'll dive deep into why that would be eventually a necessity. So the motivation for this challenge was weapons of mass distortion. So there is a report that came out recently by OpenAI that talks about how these LLMs could be misused for spreading disinformation at scale and the threat model we considered included a naive adversary who has stolen this LLM. So you saw uh, Jacob's presentation. So think about a scenario where someone has stolen DaVinci 2 instead of DaVinci 3, and this model is abusive and hasn't done the robustness checks and someone has decided to use it. So we wanted to build some sort of attribution uh, deterrence around this. And this threat model does consider that base models have not been watermarked and there's no particular effort that has been made by adversary to obfuscate these uh, models provenance. And we want to find out who has stolen it and the access you have is just simply the API and the proxy of the fine-tuned models. So AI forensics is a fairly new research field and we are going to uh, get more research, uh, reward more research in this field by perhaps starting with uh, rewarding people to come up with creative techniques on fingerprinting models and identify misbehaving models in the wild. Uh, you can read about this new paper that came out, a report that came out on uh, forecasting misuse of uh, LLMs uh, to get more insights into these mitigations. So the idea of this contest uh, uh, derived, is derived from nuclear forensics, um, where the post-detonation forensic scenarios where you collect the soil sample and then you try to determine the provenance of the, the original nuclear material. So in this case, a knife adversary has stolen the LLM and fine-tuned it for a specific task. So let's say it's fine-tuned on some sort of data sets that's uh, pretty abusive and they're trying to reuse it for personalized attack on uh, social media users. Uh, participants are given full access to the base models and only gated access to the fine-tuned models through an API. And uh, AI forensics inspectors, such as our participants, are supposed to collect the evidence that connects these fine-tuned models to the underlying base model. 
and they could so, submit the solutions, like I said, in this like kindergarten match the pair format. So they were uh, given these uh, full access to around 10, 10 to 12 base models, and they were all available on Hugging Face. So starting with GPT, Bloom, um, all the way to Diablo or Eleuther's uh, GPT-2, and participants were given unlimited queries. And based on that, they were able to collect the evidence only by using anonymous inference of API access, and we counted all the queries to make it, to keep it interesting. Uh, the evaluation criteria started with correctness of the submitted results. So out of 12 pairs, how many did you successfully match? Uh, second criteria, if there's a tie, we're going to be focused on fewest queries to, uh, to match, and then the earlier submission time. So the competition ran for four weeks, and we wanted to make sure that people uh, are rewarded to submit the results as soon as possible. Uh, so this is how the leaderboard uh, looks like. So we had uh, most recent submission counts for scoring purposes, and participants did not receive any scoring feedback on submission right away. We, however, gave them a feedback on midway point just to understand where they are in the competition and if they want to make any uh, changes. So the first prize for the competition got around $3,000, and thanks to the team at SatML for sponsoring some part of the uh, travel. Uh, second prize, uh, $1,500, and then we also had fairly uh, 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 interesting facts, like most of the winners are students, and we did intend to give them travel reimbursements and tickets to Camlis and uh, SatML itself. So thanks for that support. So TLDR, a gated access to 12 fine-tuned models, transparent access to potential base models, and compare input and output to find the base-tuned models and fine-tuned models pair, and submission would depend on pairs, accuracy pairs, and the time it, take, time it takes, and the amount of queries used, and ultimately, you get the reward for it. So I'll hand it over to Keith now to give us insights into the interesting solutions we have. Thank you. Okay, uh, so first off, uh, we have a, a short four-ish page paper uh, summarizing the results of this competition. Uh, it's hosted on the SATML website and our uh, website at mlmac.io. Um, so I'll be drawing heavily from that uh, here. Um, and what we did is uh, summarize the first iteration of the challenge, uh, publish the results and the solution. Um, we uh, came up with a taxonomy of the uh, submissions uh, that actually published uh, their solution. Um, described our own uh, baseline that was uh, part of the challenge. And um, with revealing the solution, want to encourage people to now uh, kind of use this as a shared task uh, to uh, further research in this area uh, outside of the kind of context of a four-week uh, challenge period. Um, so uh, we had 13 uh, teams submit solutions, uh, eight of which were student submissions. Uh, and four of those teams uh, beat the the uh, our baseline that we submitted. Um, and uh, five of those uh, published their solution in some form. Um, you'll hear presentations on four of them, and I'll give you reference to the blog post on the on the fifth one. Uh, so we saw a wide range of solutions um, from only using uh, uh, eleven queries to more automated approaches that used uh, thirteen thousand ish. Uh, the mean was 1,800, uh, median 6, 604. Um, so this was the leaderboard. Um, so congrats to the winners. Uh, I'm excited. The top four were all student submissions. Um, and I have to say it was very close, and it did come down to that secondary criteria of a number of queries uh, with, uh, I guess, two through four, uh, all having six out of 12 uh, correct model pairs. Um, and there's the rest of the leaderboard. Um, so the kind of taxonomy of approaches that uh, that were submitted. Um, I want to thank Liz Merkoffer, uh, one of my colleagues, for for putting this together. Um, all of the uh, uh, techniques here are uh, are cited with the position on the leaderboard, so you can quickly see, uh, you know, maybe what the first or second uh, or third place. Um, uh, solutions, what competition of techniques, uh, of what 
combination of techniques they used. Uh, we broke it down roughly into uh, manual and automated. Uh, so you can think of manual techniques, a lot of uh, handcrafted um, prompts and heuristics uh, that were developed to uh, differentiate between models. So within manual uh, techniques, we observed um, uh, a few different types of uh, kind of comparing base model uh, output given the same query. Um, and the participants made observations about uh, maybe gibberish or repetition um, based on certain queries that allowed them to distinguish uh, between certain models or uh, observing the same continu continuations from a prompt. Um, there was a lot of reasoning about the underlying training data uh, in a model. Uh, so things like uh, this is kind of getting at like what is the model capable of uh, uh, producing in in a completion. Uh, so things like the temporal range using uh, the, you know real world events to kind of date the model uh, to uh, the domain, things like uh, is it producing code or uh, uh, you know natural text, um, uh, language, model specific tokens and lengths were all kind of uh, identifiers here. Um, the last quarter category we have under manual uh, is more of like side channel information. Um, so not strictly about the outputs of the large language models themselves, but making observations about uh, how long they took to load in uh, uh, Hugging Face um, or some models that were running out of GPU memory um, also helped them identify some of these. Um, next are the automated approaches, uh, uh, which uh, again looked at uh, uh, trying to use the same query to uh, uh, kind of measure similar outputs, uh, but here using uh, several different metrics such as edit distance, machine translation metrics, um, or uh, predicting the next character. Um, and then these automated approaches also looked at similar vocabularies or uh, even trying to uh, uh, train a model um, based on the outputs and have that make uh, the predictions. Um, so drum roll, here's the actual collect correct solution. Uh, again, the fine tuned models were, were the black box. Uh, and uh, th these are the uh, uh, pairings. A um, few quick notes on this. Um, there could be, uh, in, in the case of GPT-2, there were uh, two different fine tuned models that mapped to the, the same base model. Um, we also had instances where there was a fine tuned model that didn't have uh, a, cors a corresponding base model or a base model that uh, had no corresponding fine-tuned model. Um, and we also have here on the right-hand column the number of correct attributions uh, uh, by, the, uh, by each team. So these are all out of 13 uh, submissions from the 13 teams. Um, and a quick, quick notes here, maybe the easiest ones were there was only one model that was generating code. So most people got that one right. Um, and I believe XLNet uh, was the one that had a lot of uh, repetitions and that was also easy to identify. Um, so some conclusions, uh, we think these uh, attribution techniques are still uh, very much so in their infancy. You'll hear a lot of uh, kind of creative um, uh, techniques that, that each of the participants came up with, uh, but we're still, you know, in, this challenge is, is really kind of like the MNIST of large language model attribution where it's it's very uh, kind of bounded to only 12 models where uh, in reality you could have, you know, may maybe there are uh, some limited set of, of base models everybody has, but there could be thousands of different fine tuned models. So we think uh, this is still very much so a, a hard problem that hasn't been solved because even in this um, uh, very small, uh, uh, challenge, you know, we're still at like seven out of 12 correct pairs. Um, the most successful participants are, are uh, still using manual approaches, uh, uh, which might not scale. Um, there were some automated approaches that had success, uh, and maybe in future iterations, uh, we can learn how to use some of these heuristics uh, and work those into the automated approaches. Um, so we think we've established uh, kind of a baseline for uh, you know, the attribution of non-watermarked uh, large language models. So no attempt to um, uh, kind of defend from, 
from uh, this kind of theft and misuse of uh, LLMs. Uh, so with that, we're going to switch over to uh, hearing from fourth through first place. Um, the first two uh, will be pre-recorded videos. So uh, here is uh, Farhan's uh, presentation. Hello, my name is Farhan. I'm from Pakistan, and I'm a student at National University of Computer and Emerging Sciences, FAS, Karachi. Recently, I participated in the MLMSE contest, and this video is all about my participation and experience in the competition. The full form of the MLMSE is Machine Learning Model Attribution Challenge. And as the name suggests, the main task of this competition is to identify the base model for a given unknown fine-tuned model by examining only their generated outputs. As a PhD student, I have participated under the supervision of Dr. Muhammad Rafi and represented Fast University in this contest. My submission ranked fourth overall in the first round of the competition. And I have also received an invite to present my work at the SETML 2023 conference in US North Carolina. I have also received prize money and financial support to cover travel expenses, but due to some technical legalities, I didn't get the visa on time. And due to that, I'm unable to attend the event. So that is why I have created this video to demonstrate my work, share my experience, and virtually participate in the SETML 2023 conference. In round one of the competition, the organizers has provided two different sets of models. In the first set, they provided a total of 12 well-known, pre-trained base models developed by popular organizations. In the second set, the organizers have provided a total of 12 unknown fine-tuned models. The names and architectures of all these fine-tuned models are completely hidden from participants, and we can only access them through REST APIs. So our main task in the contest was to figure out which fine-tuned model originated from which of the base model. Before thinking about the solution, let's just recap the basic purpose of fine-tuning. The art of fine-tuning is to tailor the outputs of a pre-trained base model for a specific topic to increase its usefulness in a particular domain. Keeping this statement in mind, suppose we have a pre-trained GPT-X model and we fine-tune it on the medical data set facilitate medical student in extracting medical information from a large database. Given such a scenario, it will be hard to observe the similarity in the generated outputs of the GPT-X model and its fine-tuned version for a given query that belongs to the medical domain. However, there will be a higher chance of observing similarities in the produced outputs from both the model if we pose a query from the literature domain. Thus, the main intuition of our strategy is to exploit the fundamental nature of fine-tuning. The basic idea is that fine-tuned model and its base model should show similarities in their generated responses when the post query doesn't belong to the domain for which the fine-tuned model was customized. In this challenge, we are unaware of which fine-tuned models get tailored for which domain. Therefore, we assume the more diverse query we present to the fine-tuned models, the higher the chances that the post query doesn't belong to the domain on which the model has been fine-tuned. Using this assumption in mind, we have accumulated a total of 90 queries from 10 different data sets and created four distinct approaches to solve this competition. Let's start discussing the details of the four approaches to solve the MLMSE competition. Our first approach is based on using non-parametric machine translation scoring functions such as blue and their scores. We have used this matrix directly for attributing the fine-tuned models with the corresponding base model. We have fed 90 queries as input to all the fine-tuned model and recorded their responses, and repeated the same process for all the base models. Then, we iteratively compared the responses generated by each of the fine-tuned model with the responses generated by all the base models against each of the input queries via blue and tear scores. In the end, we have paired each fine-tuned model with the base model whose generated responses are most similar to its responses on average. Next, we have used vector space model to pair fine-tuned model with the most suitable base models. We have started by feeding 90 queries to all these base models and recorded their responses. Then we constructed 12 distinct documents for each of the 12 base models 
by accumulating their generated responses to construct the VSM model. After that, we fed the same queries with the fine tune model and used their responses to find the most suitable document for it with the help of cosine similarity. In the end, we have paired each fine tune model with the base model whose associated document was most suitable for its generated responses. In our third approach, we have used multi class text classification. First, we have developed two tabular datasets. The first tabular dataset is for training the multi class text classifier, and the second is for inferencing. The first column of the training dataset contains the list of queries, while the second and third column contain responses from the base models against those queries, along with their names. Likewise, the second tabular dataset contains the same queries in its first column, while the second and third column consist of the responses from the 12th fine tune model against those queries, along with their names. The multi class text classifier can use the training dataset and learn to identify which base model can emit what kind of response. After the training process completes, the developed multi class text classifier can consume the responses of the fine tune models from the second tabular dataset and output the name for the most suitable base model that can generate that response. And in this way, we can pair each fine tune model with the most frequently predicted base model against its responses. Lastly, we have extended our third approach to perform multi class text classification in a one versus all fashion. The one versus all strategy splits a multi class classification problem into binary classification for each pair of classes by splitting the multi class dataset into binary classification problem per class. To understand this, suppose we have a multi-class problem where all examples belong to the classes red, blue, and green. We can solve this problem in a one versus all fashion by dividing the dataset into three binary classification datasets as shown in the slides. The first dataset would hold all the examples that belong to the red class as positive class and all the other classes as negative class. The second dataset will hold all the examples that belong to the blue class as a positive class and all other classes as negative class and so on in such a way we can train binary classifiers for each binary classification problem and in the end select the prediction of the binary classifier that is most confident so we have applied the same concept on the previously designed approach based on multi-class text classification to pair each fine-tune model with the base model Overall, traditional multi-class text classification using latest transformer-based BERT model has shown the best performance in our experiment compared to the other approaches for attributing fine-tuned models with their corresponding base models. We have used multi-class text classification to generate the final submission for the MLMSC competition round one. We are able to correctly pair six fine-tuned models out of 12 with their corresponding base models, thus our submission got fourth position overall. In the end, I would like to especially thank Dr. Mohammad Rafi for providing technical help in executing all the ideas and reviewing all my work. Plus, I wanted to thank Dr. Nicholas Pepernot and Hiram Anderson for giving us this amazing opportunity to present our work at the SETML 2023 conference. Lastly, I would also like to thank Kate and Dipesh and all members of the MLMSC team. Thanks for guiding us throughout the contest and answering our questions and confusion timely. That's it from my side. Thanks for listening. Have a great day ahead. Goodbye. And we have uh, now the third place is the next pre-recorded video. And then we'll hear from the runner up. First place. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings to the attendees of Chemist 2022. My name is George. I am an average senior high school student with many interests, uh, one of them being machine learning. I'm fascinated most by the many generative capabilities that have arrived from the field in recent times uh, throughout all forms of mediums like text, images, and music. I've been studying it for about a year now, but I'm still very much a beginner because there's so many things to learn. And so I usually lurk around many related communities and forums to keep myself up to date. And in early August, 
I came across an announcement for the machine learning model attribution challenge in the Hugging Face Discord. And I am here today because I have participated in the attribution challenge, uh, finishing in third place, and I was kindly invited to make a presentation on my solution. Uh, but first I'll talk about the premise of the challenge itself. As you may have already known, since GPT-2, large language models have been able to generate very realistic text, uh, sometimes even indistinguishable from those written by humans. Uh, combine this with the fact that they are publicly available, it means that anyone with a GPU and some data could download one of these models and fine tune them to their liking. Their intentions and what they ultimately do with the models could range from mostly harmless, like making a chatbot to mimic their friend, or downright malicious, like spreading mass political misinformation. The model attribution challenge poses a scenario where someone had indeed done that and asked contestants to attribute synthetic text from the fine-tuned models back to the original language models. Specifically, these 12 open source language models from big tech companies like OpenAI and Microsoft and 12 more models fine-tuned on them have been provided. Uh, contestants were free to experiment on the base models, but access to the fine-tuned ones were limited to API queries only. Additionally, the base models were not watermarked and the hypothetical adversary has not tried to obfuscate the fine-tuned model's provenance in any way. Uh, thus, in any residuals that are going to be detected are going to be purely undeliberate and solely the result of the model's nature, their training data and their fine-tuning data. As for the reasons behind this task, um, to quote from their official website, uh, model attribution would allow regulatory, the regulatory bodies to trace intellectual property theft or influence campaigns back to the base models. Next, I will be demonstrating my own approach. Uh, in summary, I have determined the unique characteristics of the base models, if there are any, of course, uh, through a selection of prompts and compared them accordingly to the fine-tuned models. I curated the list of prompts through general online research and included open-ended sentences, a list with one example, uh, multilingual text, special symbols, empty characters, etc., for the purpose of extrapolating the aforementioned characteristics and the residuals, residuals from the fine-tuned versions. Uh, alongside this, however, as you would later see, uh, Distinctive model architecture and training data would serve as equally compelling identification. There isn't much code, so I will just guide you through my thought process, test queries, conclusions, and some afterthoughts. The base models were announced first, so I checked them out to see if there were anything peculiar. First off, are the two blue models. Mm, the generated part of the text is highlighted in aqua blue for your, inconvenience, uh, for your convenience. Uh, both were specifically trained on a large corpus of multilingual text beside English, having much greater coherency on my Vietnamese test case than the rest. CodeGen Multi was a model that was specifically trained on GitHub code and pretty much output code related text in every iterations, like functions, commented lines, or copyrighted license. ExcelNet was specifically trained to generate long text, but was also prone to repetition, as you can see here. DialogGPT from Microsoft was trained on dialogues, obviously. Um, it is also a conversational model, like a chatbot. The multilingual mini LLM model is apparently a feature extractor and just returns numerical matrices instead of text. So there's no input and well, no output, I mean. 
at the time, these were all that I took note of, and I moved on to the fine-tuned models, hoping for any obvious correlations. Um, model 7 caught my eyes first. Its generations were either filled with programming terminology or straight-up code. Uh, its exclusive behavior led to the probable connection to code gen. Even more glaringly, Model 10 consistently took off half of my screen with lengthy and repetitious paragraphs. I have cut out half of these ramblings for the sake of brevity and even fitting into the slides at all. Uh, this one prompt uh, returned a grand 150 ancient repetitions followed by jumbles, uh, which was on brand with ExoNet from my prior tests. Uh, the next set of detections is probably the one I found most interesting. As I prompted away on the collab session, I noticed the initial loading time was very different between the models. Um, most of them taking around two to three attempts, but most, uh, but some as much as twelve. For each of them, it took about twenty seconds. It was most likely due to the varied model architectures rather than connection speed as they are all hosted on hunting phase. The two biggest models were GPT-6B and Bloom 2.5B. Um, I, I separated them out as potential candidates for Model 9 and Model 2, which averaged at 12 and 7 attempts each. All four of these always took at least a few minutes to query, and reportedly causing frustration for other contestants as well. And I set out to test this hypothesis with a multilingual prompt. And unsurprisingly, Model 2 gave affirming responses that are almost identical to the base model prompt. Uh, ignoring the uh, inaccurate content, we could see that they vaguely resemble the base blue model prompt, with a tone reminiscent of a food block. It is also the only model that provided any sense of structure and context in this test case, given that fine-tuning on multilingual data is unlikely because the model will only generate English unless prompted otherwise. Bloom 2.5b was the best selection. Sentimental analysis was my following choice. I chose a review from my favorite video game, added a summarizing sentence, and expected the worst. Uh, the results, though, were quite indicative. Model 2 and Model 5 thought the game was boring, and so I decided Model 5 was the smaller version of Blue. Model 9 returned icky, which was a weird term to say the least, um, not even being in the prompt. After retesting, retesting with the base models, I found out this behavior was present only in GPT based models, uh, but also throughout all of them. This supported the theory that Model 9 is in fact GPTJ. The last confident attribution that I made was with a one-shot numerical list about Millennium mass problem. Um, ignoring the typo, none, of, none except for Model 4 managed to list anything beyond the second example. Um, Cross-referencing with the remaining models, base models, uh, this consistency was limited to GPT-XL only. I drew the appropriate link between them. Um, after this point, I failed to generate anything convincing for a concrete attribution. Uh, though it wasn't completely fruitless, since I have discovered a few more miscellaneous details, like Model 4 being fine-tuned on writing prompts subreddit, or Model 6 being fine-tuned on crime and punishment by Dostoevsky. Uh, these are not exactly uh, indicative. They, they don't contribute much to my final decisions, um, but they could potentially prove to be helpful in realistic scenarios with fine-tuned models that infringe upon intellectual rights. And that's about it, really. 
uh, this method managed to get six out of 12 models correctly, which is quite surprising considering how simple it really is. Um, I think that a part of this was maybe because purely applying algorithms that only process the synthetic text would de wouldn't detect the differences in the model's metadata, which was clearly a significant factor. But well, then again, it is after our very ideally constructed case. Uh, what if the traces have been purposefully removed or tampered with? Um, should developers begin injecting identification prompts into their models? Um, should there also be a focus on developing a method to detect where the fine-tuning data was scraped from, as I um, spoke about before? And uh, I think most importantly, how would the average person become aware of the misleading synthetic text when they come across it on social media platforms? I think my solution is an answer to that final question or at least an attempt to, at making a sort of basic guideline on how to approach these models. Um, the documented version can be found on my GitHub. There's the QR code. And finally, I'd like to thank the Mitre Atlas team for kindly hosting the competition and having me here today. They have been very supportive and helpful throughout the whole process, which is much appreciated on my part. Thank you everyone also for tuning in and goodbye. Hello everyone, my name is Yu Longding. I'm currently an undergrad at Shenzhen University from China. So today I'm going to present our run-up solution to model attribution challenge. And we're the second place in this competition with accuracy of 50%, which is just tied with the official baseline in terms of accuracy but with much fewer number of queries needed, which is just less than 0.1% of the baseline. Um, before we get started, I want to briefly talk about some background about language, language models. And language models are actually autoregressive generating models. And to generate a sentence, it, um, it, it totally uh, predicts the next word given the prefix this can be expressed by this formula. So, and to predict the next word, a sample from distribution conditioned on all the previous words. For example, to generate a sentence, it totally generates the next word like this. And it's actually a probability process given the same preface generated sentence may be different for different random seeds. And I also want to briefly recap the problem setting. We have API access of a set of fine-tuned language models. That is, we have Oracle of a set of functions, capital F sub I of X and R, where X is input query and R denotes randomness. We also have full access of the base models. The task is to figure out the J for each I, such as capital F sub I is fine-tuned based on F sub J. Um, at first, I want to present a non-solution. Now, when I get to study this problem, I send API requests through my Jupyter notebook. I know in Jupyter notebook, it will show the execution time for each cell block. And I've got a bunch of execution time when I query different fine-tuned models. And um, it seems like if the model have more parameters, it will have much a uh, longer time to uh, generate the sentence. So since we also have full access to a base model, we can sort the base model according to their model size. And we also sort all the fine model based on their execution time. And we just create a line them and the corresponding pair is just the answer. So yeah, so we're pretty happy with this observation. And it's actually a side channel timing tag and as indicated by its name, non-solution, several days later, I look at the, you know, the text generated by the model. And all of a sudden, I found that you know, the difference in the execution time is mainly due to the difference in the length of text it generated. So it's kind of funny. And so I go to think about another method to handle this problem. And the most straight and naive approach is just naive brute force. 
And we fix some input query X, for example, generates a sentence describing a C. And we queue the models, all the models using the same query will repeat for will repeat with many different random seeds. The intuition is just a distribution of capital F sub I will be similar to the FJ if they are corresponding pair. And yeah, so this really motivates me to think about some more philosophical points. You know, if we fix some knowledge K and we know that if the base model knows some knowledge, well, that means that model fine-tuned on it will also have this knowledge. Well, not necessary because it may, during the fine-tuning, it may forgot it, or so it is also um, possible to inherit. So we are, then we are not quite sure about it. And if the base model doesn't know the knowledge K, um, does that mean that the, base, uh, the fine tune model also doesn't know. Well, it also can depend because, you know, if the fan, if the data sets in the fine tuning process contains such knowledge, the fine tuning model may learn from it. So we also not quite sure. Well, it seems like we are kind of stuck because, you know, uh, it seems like there's no such rule that we quite sure. And um, yeah, but we do. Um, but we can have some attempts, you know, um, we have, since we have full access to the base model, this means we have access to model parameters and we have knowledge of the training, pro training process, for example, the training data sets and training paradigm. And in the following, I'm gonna show three examples that exploits the training data set. Okay, so this is a description of the training data used to train gpt Neo. So it basically says it's trained on pair, a large scale created data set. And uh, you know, by created, it means all the private information have been removed from the data set. And so I try to kill the model use and try to extract the private information and the input I design is my passport here. And there is a model that the answer is my passport is a no passport, it is a passport. And I try another input, which is I live in, so the answer of this model is, I live in a small town in the middle of nowhere. So it, seem like, it seems like this model has always been trying to hide some private information. So I have high confidence that this model is, this model is actually trained from GBT Neo. And here's another example. This is a description of the training data that used to train OPT. So it's basically said it's trained on you know, more than 10K unpublished books. And there are terms like story like style. So um, with the input of my phone number is, there is a model that output is. My phone number is, she gets like man. And when I try the input, import random, the output of this model is import, uh, import random the door, she stamped up to her alternate stairs. So obviously he, this model is always trying to you know, tell a story or something. And so I come to I came to a conclusion that this fine model is actually come from OPT. And I'll give a final example. Here is the description of the blue model. It says that it was trending six uh, 46 languages and oh it seems like it's multilingual. And you know I'm Chinese, so I guess you will know what I'm going to do. I input a Chinese called um, it translated into non full spring is a little. Um, there is a model that answers this question correctly. It's non full spring is a little bit sweet. By correctly, I mean non full spring is a little sweet. It's actually a very famous advertising slogan in China. In China. So if you ask any Chinese, uh, non full spring is a little what, the answer must be sweet. So, and there, so I come to the conclusion that this model is blown. Two billion five, and there is another model. His answer is uh, non full spring. It's a bit cold. It is correct in terms of semantics, but it's just not so Chinese. So I come to the conclusion: this is blue. Uh, another uh, the smaller blue model. So I mean, uh, I mean, through this input, we can not only distinguish blue models to other models, but we can also distinguish between the the blue model family since. 
the, uh, the, the first blue model, you have 2 billion parameters and second blue mo uh, model have uh, millions of parameters. So the, mo the model with larger parameters can memorize more things. Um, yeah, so pretty cool, right? But this is no whole story. I mean, after a, com after a competition, when the organizer published the, the correct answer, no, the truth is only the last example leads to correct attribution. Yeah, so I mean, you know, that the, the first example of private information and the second example of, uh, you know, storyteller, that leads to wrong answer. So quite frustrating, and only this ch Chinese, um, you no, know, uh, advertising slogan is correct. So, but uh, you know, I, since I have fifty percent of accuracy, I've also tried, I tried with other prompts, for example, program language input, for example, input like the C plus plus code and import TensorFlow. As you know, as you might see, the correct answer is import TensorFlow as TF. And there also I try some mathematical language, for example, LaTeX to see if you can, if the model can write LaTeX. And also, I tried some multi reasoning, for example, OT is 10 multiplied by 15. And actually, just this, and uh, just this inputs works very well. And through this, I correctly, basically, I correctly uh, six models. And also, there are definitely many, many more uh, examples that may or may not be help. Anjal, coming up next, uh, and let me. I might have lost my Zoom. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Pranjal Agarwal, uh, an undergrad student at, uh, at IIT Delhi. Currently I'm pursuing my majors in computer science and engineering. And today I'm going to present my solution for uh, model learning, uh, machine learning model attribution challenge. So starting with the motivation, I think it has been repeated quite a while now, uh, but still I will reiterate some important points. So large language models have raised concern of responsible AI as they can easily generate text indifferentiable to text written by humans. So for example, the text written by in this slide was by an AI agent or, or, or maybe not. I mean, that's the point. You cannot differentiate uh, the text. So what these models pose a risk of spreading large amounts of misinformation and harmful content. However, at the current stage, there is no proper method to attribute these generations to the miscreant. So if an attribution was possible, we can possibly identify the parent AI company that allowed uh, the model to be fine tuned on harmful data sets. So that's what the motivation of this competition was. So to discuss some of the current methods that are being uh, used. So in, uh, with the recent advent of chat GPT, like large language models, there have been some uh, methods deployed, but these methods are just limited to binary classification. They predict whether the text is AI written or human written. Moreover, these uh, methods are usually trained neural network or other quantitative methods that lack a lot of explainability. So just to iterate what kinds of quantitative methods are being used. So some methods use the perplexity of the text generated and look if it matches with the, those of the base models. Some look at the monotonicity of the sentence length and as such, it is expected that the AI would be generating some monotonous uh, sentences. Similarly, we can look at the uh, similarity of the text generated to the original model. And also there are like neural network based method that are currently being deployed. For example, OpenAI currently uses a neural network based method for uh, AI de detection. On the other hand, there is a set of qualitative methods which are based on certain heuristics and which I'm going to talk more about because that's what my solution is going to revolve around. So just to iterate what the competition setup was, we had a set of 12 base models. We had a set of 12 unknown fine-tuned models, and these can be queried only using prompt response setup, basically through uh, text APIs. Then we had uh, the task of find, uh, attributing the fine-tuned models to the base models. 
And important thing is the mapping can be many to one. That is a single find, uh, like single base model can derive multiple fine tune models. The important part is that these pre-trained models were of different families. And by family, I mean like they were either uh, gen uh, developed by different companies or at different times. And moreover, these models range from like small models, like 82 million parameters to very large, like 6 billion parameters. Another important uh, aspect was that we had the tie-breaking rule of number of total queries. So it's important while developing a solution to make sure that the number of queries you make are small. And this limits a lot of things, for example, doing quantitative uh, uh, approaches because they would be requiring large number of uh, API queries. So now coming to my solution. So instead of an automated approach, I apply a series of heuristics to hierarchically partition each of these models and like label each partition with the correct set of base models. Uh, or in other words, if I say it's a decision tree, but the decision function in each of the node is manually chosen. So the method works because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to exploit the fact that models have different number of parameters or they have a different pretending data set or even a different training objective. Moreover, uh, I will say that all the used heuristics can be further developed into whole new method as I'm going to discuss in the next few slides. So overall, the solution can be considered as something similar to what is found in cybersecurity and the whole pipeline, I imagine that in future, uh, would be built into a suite of tools. And currently, while I say that uh, my approach was manual, I believe that uh, it is possible for these two uh, methods to be done completely in an uh, autonomous manner. So coming to the heuristics that were used to decide which model is what, uh, there were like 12 to 15 heuristics that I used, but it's not possible to discuss. So I'm only going to focus on the top five, the most five, uh, relevant ones. So coming to the idea of temporal filtering. So consider an event or a word that was introduced after a date D. So let this date D be uh, 2020. So if a model is trained before 2020, it cannot possibly have any information about that event. On the other hand, if the model was trained before, uh, after 2020, and the event is very common in the data set, that even after fine tuning, the model should not forget it. Basically, even after fine tuning, the model will have its context. So for example, if I take the example of COVID-19, so only the models that were trained after 2020, they were five out of those 12, will have that context. So for example, if I prompt the model with, in the last few years, COVID-19 has. So the model one generation is being a deadly virus and so on. So which is the right context. On the other hand, if you look at the model two, it says that it improved exponentially and it truly has worked beautifully in a very exciteful manner. Clearly this model has got no context what COVID-19 is. And similarly is the case with model three. So based on this idea, if I prompt each of the 12 models, I can segregate them into post 2020 and pre 2020 models. And like, this is one of the heuristics. And if I apply these heuristics uh, multiple times, I get a decision tree. So another heuristic is about memorization. So effectively what I'm trying to tackle is that um, with the scaling of model and increasing the number of parameters, the memorization ability increases. So for example, if I prompt the model to complete a sequence or a series, uh, for example, a mathematical series, uh, the larger models will be able to complete the sequence while shorter models will either fail at the midway or in the beginning. So let's take this example of uh, prompting with Fibonacci sequences. So I prompt the model with the first nine uh, numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. So the model one is able to generate all the five next uh, numbers correctly. On the other hand, if we are talking about model two, it is able to generate only the next two uh, terms in the sequence correctly. On the other hand, the model three does not even knows what this sequence is about. So what this shows is that model one, model two and model three, if they belong to the same family, Model one is more likely to be a larger model, while model three is going to be a smaller one. And then there's this idea of domain specific fine tuning. So the assumption here is that if a miscreant wants to uh, fine tune a model, it's going to do it uh, on a model that was pre-trained specifically for that purpose. What I mean to say is that if a miscreant wants to train a code generation model, it will take a model that was trained on code and not on language. So that is one of the strong assumptions that I'm making over here. 
So what this means is that if I prompt the model on different formats, for example, for code, maybe for dialogue, uh, the, and based on the generation quality, we can decide what the model was, or what it could have been. So for example, in on the left, uh, we can see that uh, the model seven generates the code pretty nicely. And it's most likely that it was a code generation model. And another reason is that uh, the code generation models generally have different token types. And these token types are especially uh, for indentation. For example, single tabs, double tabs, triple tabs are directly embedded as a single vocabulary item in the code generation models. Similarly, we can apply this heuristic for uh, identifying the di dialogue models. Next is the idea of multilinguality. So the basic concept is that all models are not trained on all languages. So for example, if we look at the first point, so Indic languages were present only in the training data set of blue models. So these blue models are some open source models. So if I prompt the language model on Indic languages, and if it's not able to complete the sentence or it's, it doesn't get the context, it's most likely it's not going to be a blue model. Similarly, we can look at the model size. So it's very clear that this, uh, the translation ability of a model increases with the increasing size. So if the model is not able to translate to something, it's most likely a smaller model. Similarly, we can look at the memorization. So even if the model is not explicitly trained on some spe specific language, the idea is that some of the common uh, phrases or terms will be remembered. The final heuristic I'm gonna discuss is about tokens. So this is pretty straightforward idea. So different models have, again, different set of vocabularies. So if you look at the unique tokens in certain model, we can prompt based on them and uh, look at the generated response to identify if the model belongs to that family or not. Similarly, there are some special tokens. So for example, CLS and end of text tokens, basically what they signify is when do we have to create a separation? When do we have to change the context? And when do we have to end the text? So uh, just to mention, these special tokens have a special point in the embedding. And if I am able to typo them, them uh, then what would happen is that a model that understood that uh, token as it is will, uh, will change its generation completely. While an another model that had no context of what end of text means will keep on remaining this, uh, doing the same generation. So what this enables us is to divide the models again. So there are like a lot of other heuristics. So we can be doing question answering, like who is the president of US in 2023? So a older model will not be able to answer, of course. And we can do mathematical reasoning or common sense reasoning. Again, uh, these parameter, these benchmarks scale with the model size, so we can easily segregate between them. Then we can do training data extractions and other kind of attacks. Uh, so finally, just to mention like what the uh, decision tree looks like. So at each step, I uh, apply some heuristic and decide uh, and put the fine-tuned models in a different set. And the green ones are the like final attributed models. So basically I use different kind of ideas like code prompting, token prompting, dialogue prompting, looking at multilingual abilities, mathematical abilities, and so on. So to summarize the idea uh, of the solution, so what I use is I use a di diverse set of heuristics and these heuristics are designed to exploit the differences in model size, pre-training data set, and the domain on which they were trained, or rather the training objective. Each of the heuristics, I believe, can be developed further into a more concrete set of rules and benchmark. So for example, the temporal idea, I deliberately use the COVID-19 uh, term. However, if we look at the data set and do some uh, data mining, we can identify certain words and phrases that would be, diff uh, that would be different in different data sets. Moreover, we can explore the automation in the prompts because after all the prompts are like of certain format. And recently we have seen that large language models can further help us generate these kind of prompts. And in fact, even for the evaluation, we can clearly see if like uh, the context is getting matched. Finally, I would say that qualitative results of offer more explainability in the predictions which is currently specially needed because the current neural network based methods that are deployed in the uh, market have high false positivity rates. So you do not want to attribute some uh, model to some company by saying that I'm only 50% sure. You have to be 100% uh, sure uh, to attribute someone. So thank you. That's all uh, for my solution. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so that um, was our final uh, solution presentation.
Um, I'll just note there was one other uh, published solution, uh, and you can check out the blog post from Joseph uh, here. <clears throat> um, so what's next for uh, this challenge? Um, we do have a, a kind of round two uh, scaled up version of this built with uh, kind of additional base models and fine-tuned models um, where we're trying to maybe encourage uh, more automated approaches, uh, make it harder to um, uh, maybe uh, rule things out by process of elimination. Um, and uh, you can check this out on Kaggle. Uh, we uh, hope to continue uh, this line of inquiry and continue to develop the, the competition. Um, so invite you to participate. Uh, all the details are on the website, mlmac.io. Um, uh, you know, welcome you to uh, join in, try the shared task, uh, participate in future iterations and join the uh, discussion. We have a Slack channel. Um, and now I wanna open it up to group discussion. Uh, so if you uh, had any uh, lingering questions for either of the presenters or had any questions about the competition, uh, open it up. <clears throat> 